Just real quick, I've got my own homebrew example of what I've done to change up orcs. Hello everyone, and welcome back down here to the Gamer's Den with me, your host, Jordan, your master of lore and storyteller extraordinaire. And as I said, we'll be talking about changing up orcs just one last time, and today I'm going to go over something I've done for my own homebrew world and setting, and what exactly it was that I did to change up orcs for that. But before we get into those details, if you're new here to the channel, then go on down there and hit that subscribe button and become a regular member here at the Gamer's Den. Or, if you're already listed on such a legendary roster, then go on down to hit the like button and share the video far and wide. But, with all that uh, self-promoting done and out of the way, we'll go ahead and talk about some works now. So, for my own setting, uh, there's a whole lot of homebrew that I will skip over for, but for now we are going to talk about the Orcs of Three Tusk Hold. The Orcs of Three Tusk Hold took the, uh, took the hold from the former occupants, the Silver Spire Dwarves, and this was known as the Silver Spire Mountain Home. And it was uh, a place where the Dwarves, of course, engaged in all the classic Dwarven activities, you know, clan structures, lawful neutral to lawful good society, uh, mining, smelting ores, manufacturing finished goods, and exporting uh, ingots, weapons, armor, different metallic works of art, stonework, so many incredible things that left their mountain. But uh, at some point, a group of orcs descended on the place, an amalgamation of several different tribes of orcs led by a powerful war leader who believed that the destiny of his people was going to be found in these more southern lands. And he chose this spot based off of his own instincts and also off of what the uh, the different council of shamans were telling him. So they attacked and they attacked and the fighting for the, the Silver Spire Mountains was intense, just absolutely brutal with bodies mounting up nearly up to the height of the mountain peaks themselves, or so the exaggerations and stories say. But the point is, they make their way into the mountain, both, uh, mostly from above, as when they're fighting down at about the base of the mountain, over the gates, trying to find a way in, climbing crews go up, and they make their way up through the uppermost levels of the peaks, and manage to actually get in behind dwarven lines, behind some of their best and final fortifications, meant to hold out as that last, expensive, desperate gasp, meant to make your opponents pay for every inch of ground taken. So the orcs were able to create a two-front war at the front gates and up at the top of the peaks. To make a long story much shorter, the dwarves call in the Corvarian Empire for aid. They finally break and ask for help, so the Empire shows up. And fighting gets kind of ground more to a halt and a standstill rather than any kind of decisive victory because a good portion of the orc forces are now inside the upper levels of the mountain. So it's a siege, it's attrition, it's a grinding brutal warfare, it's essentially urban warfare, room to room, tunnel to tunnel, and it's absolutely devastating. So, but eventually, the uh, dwarves and the Corvarian Empire are able to prevail, and they are able to send an assassin in to take care of the warlord and several other high-ranking orc officials, creating a, sl uh, a wedge, however slight or significant the DMs might want to imagine that to be. It created a wedge and a delayed coordination for the orc forces, so they get overwhelmed. And the dwarves... The dwarves seeing just such utter devastation rigged across their home with the the sheer amount of casualties, not just the dead, but the number of people injured afterwards. There's no way that they're going to be able to shore up their workforce for at least a generation, and even then they're still going to struggle to recover. So what they did was they took the remaining orcs that they were able to round up and capture and put them in the mines. They reset up, restructured their mines, and built new barracks so that way the orcs could be housed as a slave labor force meant to dredge up all the ores and coal and all in the stone necessary for them to keep up their manufacturing and supply. And so this began of the start of a very hard turn for the dwarves. This kind of brutal warfare left a distinct mark on their cultural psyche 
the to the point that the net over the next 300 years their treatment of the orcs gets to be more and more barbaric and harsher and harsher and each successive generation of dwarves that's about to come up they are learning this behavior and not only that they aren't going down into the mines they're strictly metal workers or warriors or stone workers as uh, stone carvers that is they're not doing the actual mining and extraction of any of the materials that they're working with anymore but the orcs are and it's to the point that at one point the dwarven high king who had as a young prince very young prince been captured by the orcs just flat out said when he was told that the uh, shipments of grain breads and just basic sustenance going down to the orcs was no longer sufficient he just dismissively said let them eat their dead and this eventually set off a chain of events where the orcs rise up in rebellion against the dwarves and they actually managed to fight their way free, drive the dwarves out of the mountain home before the Corvarian Empire is able to step in effectively again. And they're actually able to push them out towards the closer towards the borders of the empire and manage to fight both forces to a standstill to a point where they're able to negotiate and leverage an armistice that eventually turns into a peace agreement. Now, you might be thinking, okay, Jordan, you've given us a lot of detail and information, a lot of backstory in your setting. What does that do about the orcs? What, how does this change their culture? What did I change their culture to? And to be honest, I didn't pick out a real world culture. I picked out two historical events that were pretty awful and applied them to a current situation. Oh, well, not a current situation, a situation in my game. And that was uh, cultural obliteration and slavery. Both are pretty heavy-handed topics, but the basis of this was what this kind of what caused me to bring these in was, man, dwarves living a long time, you know, five hundred, six, possibly seven hundred years. How does that affect their their perception of time and their relationship with other species? I mean, humans, we have so many f festivals and holidays and commemorative events. Uh, in order to leave events as part of a collective cultural history. Dwarves and elves especially don't need to do that because, well, in this instance, 300 years after a very brutal, very scarring war, they still, they still have people alive who experience that firsthand, including their high king. Their high king still carries a lot of trauma, a lot of scars, a lot of memory... Uh, memories of what had happened and they can't help but see the orcs as nothing else whereas the orcs this has been several generations in now they have nothing to do with what happened to them uh, what happened to the dwarves and they are not responsible for why they are in chains and suffering at the hands of the dwarves but that's the situation as it exists and it makes sense, doesn't make it good, but it's an interesting situation. It's a pretty hard situation to uh, um, to try to uh, parse your way through what the moral co course of action is. I mean, you might know what the moral course of action is, or at least I believe you should know. I know, but try convincing the dwarves that it's time to let the orcs go, that they've been punished more than enough and these ones are being punished for something distant ancestors had done for them but for the dwarves that's not the case so you can see how this goes in circles it presents an interesting and very difficult uh, position for the players to deal with and even more so now that the orcs have taken control of the hold but now you might be asking okay where does cultural obliteration come in well these people were kept as slaves and they've been kept as slaves for generations and not only that, but given how ubiquitous magic is in this setting, the dwarves would have to have a way of dealing with that. Well, that means removing spellcaster's ability to speak, to gesticulate, to remove, and they're removing their ability to speak, especially with their clerics, and druids, and the like, people who might be administering healing and definitely bringing a lot of magic to bear removing their ability to speak and perform magic removes a lot of their ability to tap into their cultural history and their various lores that might have been present there and that is a pretty important and major step in obliterating that kind of a culture so 
the orcs are now in a position where they almost essentially are trying to regain and rediscover their own culture and they have us had a situation where one of their prominent leaders of of this uh orcish society had begged for any kind of mercy and supplication from any of the in supplication from any of those higher powers that might be listening and a goddess of hearth and home stepped in as a goddess of hearth and home part of that portfolio is providing succor to those who are in suffering providing shelter and the like so she helped to free the orcs gave the orcs divine backing where so much had been removed before and is now assisting them in recovering their lost culture and history while at the same time inserting herself in and get uh, gaining a new crop of followers for herself so this all presents a very culturally malleable position for the orcs but things are beginning to form like their leaders they they have a whole council of leaders that sits down and discusses how they're going to run the day-to-day -day, uh, events of their new home as well as how they're going to negotiate with the empire with the silver spire dwarves or at least those who are willing to negotiate and as part of their uh, initiation rites for being leaders for orc society, they have iron shackles permanently welded onto their hands. They're welded and closed shut. Or I should say their wrists. So that way they never forget where they came from and what they went through to get to this position. It's a daily reminder for them that they are doing this in service of others. The chains might be broken, but the shackles still remain. And because the shackles still remain, they never forget the weight of their responsibility so that it, this never befalls them again. And as I mentioned a couple videos back, one of the key things that they're doing to gain leverage in negotiating with the dwarves is they've purposely gone out of their way to not plunder the tombs and vaults of various families. They might be emptying out coffers and uh, um, just flat out, uh, flat out uh, vaults of coinage but they're not disturbing mausoleums or individual graves. And by respecting those burial sites, they now have a solid, a hefty uh, leverage point in negotiations when dealing with the Silver Spire doors. Because if the doors press too hard, maybe those mausoleums become fair game. And the dwarves don't want that, and the dwarves don't have a way of stopping that, especially not stopping it en masse. So, everybody's kind of afraid to move forward. There's other things at play there too, like the fact that the orcs were able to fight two separate armies to a standstill. But, yeah, it presents some interesting things. Just by making the orcs a little bit more aware, wiping out what the previous orc culture had been, we're at a point where we can start adding in our own details as they rediscover their culture. And as they, because their culture was wiped out, even as they rediscover it, it's still going to be fundamentally altered because they've had to grow and adapt to their new situations. So there's a lot to play with there. There's a lot to think about if you really want to dive into it. And the awkward, heavy, heavy material is definitely a good starting point for that too. But again, I would recommend you be very, very careful when bringing elements like that into your own games. And is where I would say it's important to talk to your players so that way they understand what's at hand there. And in my case, I left this as a previous part of their history that comes up, especially since it's only recently ended, but is not the central focal point. But what do you think? Go on down to the comments below and let me know your thoughts. Did you like what I presented here? Do you dislike it? Is there anything that you might add or questions that you might have? Hit those like or dislike buttons and go on down to the comments below and let me know your thoughts. And if you haven't done so already, then go on down to hit the subscribe button. But with all that said, I've been Jordan, your master of lore and storyteller extraordinaire. Thank you all so very much for your time and you all have yourselves a good night.